Hello there and welcome to the channel everyone. In the last video we talked about Lipomus or the sunfish genus. In this video we're going to cover the eighth and final genus in the sunfish family and that's Micropterus or the black bass genus. The Micropterus genus is the sister genus to the Lipomus or sunfish genus. This means if you go back far enough in time these two groups shared a common ancestor at some point. Most estimates based on DNA sequence data and fossil evidence suggest Lipomus and Micropterus diverged around 25 million years ago. Today, these two groups superficially have very little in common, but all species in Micropterus and Lipomus do have three anal fin spines. The three species of Aeneacanthus, the banded sunfishes, also have three anal fin spines, but they have rounded caudal fins. But technically, there are three genera with three anal fin spines in the sunfish family. Micropterus, Lipomus, and Aeneacanthus. There are currently 19 forms of black bass in the Micropterus genus, including described species, informally recognized or provisional species, and subspecies. Described means there was a formal scientific description or paper describing the fish, how it's different, where it lives, and its scientific name. A new species becomes valid once the description is published in a scientific journal, but there is still some dispute about the current status of some forms in the Micropterus genus. The Florida bass, for example, was first identified by science in 1822. It was later described as a subspecies of the largemouth bass in 1949, but additional research has shown it should be elevated to a distinct species. Today, Many experts recognize the Florida bass as a separate species, but it's still technically considered a subspecies of the largemouth bass by the American Fisheries Society. Other forms have not been described by science, but are informally recognized as provisional species. The best way to explain how we got to this point is to probably start at the beginning. Micropterus is Greek, and it means small wing or fin. In a previous video, we talked about how the modern system of taxonomy was developed in Europe. Well, there was a time over 200 years ago when scientists in Europe dominated biology and taxonomy, and they were naming plants and animals from all over the world, including North America. Preserved specimens were shipped across oceans back to museums and universities all over Europe. The first black bass described by science was actually a smallmouth bass, and it had a damaged soft dorsal fin. This was most likely an old injury that healed, but to the French naturalist looking at this fish for the first time in 1802, the damaged fin looked like a second small dorsal fin. So the genus was more or less stuck with the name Micropterus from this point on, because the smallmouth bass was the first or type species to be described by science. We already talked about this in the rock bass video, but if you missed it, you might be wondering why black bass are in the sunfish family instead of the temperate or true bass family. Well, black bass aren't really bass. But first, we need to explain what a bass is and the origin of the word bass. The word bass was used as early as the 18th century to describe fish that were perch-like. Why perch? Well, since most people coming to North America were from Europe, they were already familiar with the European perch. It's a fish with a huge distribution that includes most of Europe and the northern half of Asia. European perch were also harvested commercially, so they were in fish markets all over Europe, and it was just a fish that everyone knew and could relate to. So what makes a fish perch-like? Well, the dorsal and anal fins are divided into spiny and soft rayed portions. The pelvic fins usually have one spine up to five soft rays and are positioned forward near the head. Most types of bass also have tenoid scales and an elongate, moderately compressed body shape like perch. You can also eat perch. These are just a few reasons the common name bass was applied to so many different species in fresh and salt water. The European bass was actually the first bass to be described by science in 1758. Black bass and rock bass being native to the New World were not described until the following century. Why does this matter? Well, when the European bass was described, it more or less became the type species for the temperate bass family. Meaning all other species grouped together with the European bass would have to possess some shared characteristics. Black bass and rock bass have almost nothing in common with European bass, so that could never happen. 
Temperate bass or true bass not only look different, they have very different habitat and life history requirements. Temperate bass are broadcast spawners, meaning the adults migrate into rivers and shallow inshore areas to disperse their eggs. Temperate bass do not build nests or provide parental care for the young. Females release eggs into the water over a spawning ground. As this happens, the eggs are fertilized by males swimming alongside the female. Since temperate bass do not build nests or care for the young, they make up for this by releasing a large number of eggs. A single female striped bass can release up to 4 million eggs, while female largemouth bass average around 4,000 eggs. Striped bass eggs also have to stay in motion and move with the current. If there isn't enough current to keep the eggs moving, they'll sink to the bottom where silt, detritus, and other debris will cover the eggs and kill them. Some people may also be wondering about peacock bass. Peacock bass build nests and provide parental care for the young, but they're actually cichlids. They were even described and classified as peacock cichlids in 1801, but are often called bass to elevate their status as game fish. Cichlids are fish from the family Cichlidae in the order Cichliforms. In most types of cichlid fish, the male will be larger than the female. Male cichlids also develop a pronounced forehead hump of fatty tissue as they mature. Cichlids also have one nostril on each side of the head instead of the usual two like most fish, including sunfish. Cichlids also have a two-part lateral line with the front portion higher than the rear portion. Peacock bass are a tropical species native to South America. There are more than 15 described species of peacock bass, and they all have a false eye spot at the base of the caudal fin, just like Oscars and Mayan cichlids. Peacock bass also have rounded caudal fins like most types of cichlid fish. The term black bass was one of the original names for the smallmouth bass over 200 years ago, and since it was the first or type species to be described by science, the name was adopted for the Micropterus genus. So black bass, like all centrarchids, are freshwater species native only to North America. They have a laterally compressed body shape and the anal fin has multiple spines. The dorsal fins are fused or broadly connected and the males also construct and guard a nest. And some of the characteristics that distinguish black bass from other centrarchids, they have a more elongated, robust body shape. The anal fins have three spines, they have relatively large mouths. They are the largest members of the sunfish family. They have an aggressive, predatory nature, so they readily hit artificial lures. They jump when hooked. Black bass are also found throughout a large part of North America and have been introduced around the world, so they're accessible to a wide range of anglers. All this makes black bass extremely popular sport fish. Okay, let's start with the smallmouth bass. Across the native range of the smallmouth bass, there is some variation, and several studies have shown that there are at least three distinct genetic lineages or forms. The smallmouth or northern smallmouth bass, the Neosho smallmouth bass, and the Washita smallmouth bass. The smallmouth bass was the first black bass to be described by science in 1802. Two subspecies were later described in 1940 that are still recognized today the northern smallmouth bass, and the Neosho smallmouth bass. The northern smallmouth bass has a broad native range and has been widely introduced around the world. Northern smallmouth bass are generally brown to bronze with 8 to 16 dark vertical bars on the sides of the body. Body coloration can vary depending on several factors including the environment, water clarity, cover present, season, and sex of the fish. The cheek and gill cover have three dark streaks that radiate from the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, extends to the middle of the eye when the mouth is closed. The northern smallmouth bass actually has the smallest mouth in the Micropterus genus. Most smallmouth bass from the upper Mississippi Great Lakes system do not have a tooth patch on the tongue. But some smallmouth bass in the Tennessee and Cumberland drainages will have teeth on the tongue. The pelvic fins of most northern smallmouth bass have pigment on the entire fin and appear brown to bronze, while the pelvic fins on most other species have a white translucent appearance. 
The northern smallmouth bass is native to the middle and upper Mississippi River Basin, including the St. Lawrence River Great Lakes System and the Hudson Bay Drainage Basin. Northern smallmouth bass are habitat generalists and can be found in lakes and streams throughout their native range, although they generally prefer clearer water and areas with more current than largemouth bass or even spotted bass. Northern smallmouth bass are also more commonly found in areas with some kind of rock substrate mixed with sand or gravel. In creeks and rivers, northern smallmouth bass primarily feed on crayfish, aquatic insects, and other invertebrates living in or near the rocks. Larger individuals have also been known to feed on sculpins, darters, and other fish. In natural lakes and man-made impoundments, northern smallmouth bass feed primarily on other fish, including shad, yellow perch, bluegill, shiners, smelt, ciscos, and gobies. Northern smallmouth bass max out around 24 inches. The IGFA All Tackle World Record weighed 11 pounds, 15 ounces, and was caught from Dale Hollow Lake in Tennessee. In 1940, another distinct lineage or form of smallmouth bass was described that's still recognized today. The Neosho smallmouth bass. The Neosho smallmouth bass typically has a more slender, elongated body shape compared to the northern smallmouth bass. Body coloration is also more uniform, fading gradually to a white belly. The vertical bars on the sides of the Neosho smallmouth bass are typically not as long and wider, becoming more diamond-shaped near the tail. Neosho smallmouth bass also typically have a larger, dark opercular spot on the gill cover. The cheek and gill cover have three dark streaks that radiate from the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, also extends to the back of the eye when the mouth is closed. So not only is the mouth larger, but the lower jaw actually projects beyond the snout when the mouth is closed. On some fish, the teeth pads are visible from above when the mouth is closed. Some Neosho smallmouth bass will have a tooth patch on the tongue. The anal and pelvic fins have pigment on the entire fin and are usually a light yellow-brown color. The Neosho smallmouth bass is native to the Neosho River drainage and adjacent tributaries of the Illinois and Middle Arkansas rivers in the Ozark Mountain region of Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas. The subspecific name Velox is Latin and means swift. This name refers to the habitat type where the species is most abundant. Neosho smallmouth bass are stream specialists, so they're only found in habitats that retain free-flowing characteristics. The natural range of the Neosho smallmouth bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments and the introduction of non-native northern smallmouth bass, so that now it's only found in the upper reaches of some tributaries. Neosho smallmouth bass primarily feed on crayfish, aquatic insects, and other invertebrates, but larger individuals also feed on other fish. For Neosho smallmouth bass, average size is 8 to 10 inches, and they max out around 16 inches. And the third distinct lineage, or form of smallmouth bass, is an undescribed form known as the Washita smallmouth bass. There isn't a lot of information about this fish on the internet, but the ones I've seen typically have spots in the soft dorsal and anal fins. And in some populations, you'll see fish that have orange to yellow coloration in the pelvic fins, and around the outer edge of the anal fin. Body coloration is also more mottled compared to the Neosho smallmouth bass and the northern smallmouth bass. Some Washita smallmouth bass will have a tooth patch on the tongue. The Washita smallmouth bass is native to the Little and Washita River drainages in the Washita Mountain region of Oklahoma and Arkansas. Washita smallmouth bass are stream specialists so they're only found in habitats that retain free-flowing characteristics. The natural range of the Washita smallmouth bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments and the introduction of non-native northern smallmouth bass, so that now it's only found in the upper reaches of some tributaries. Washita smallmouth bass primarily feed on crayfish, aquatic insects, and other invertebrates, but larger individuals also feed on other fish. For Washita smallmouth bass, average size is 10 to 12 inches, and they max out around 20 inches. The largemouth bass was the second black bass to be described by science in 1802. It's also the second largest member of the Micropterus genus. Only the Florida bass is larger. 
Largemouth bass and Florida bass are not only the largest species in the genus, but they're also the largest members of the sunfish family. They also have the largest mouths of all the black basses. On most largemouth bass and Florida bass, the upper jaw or maxilla extends beyond the back of the eye when the mouth is closed. Body coloration can vary, again, based on several factors. Largemouth bass have a midlateral stripe that's often broken into a series of blotches forming a jagged, horizontal stripe that runs from the snout to the caudal fin. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected but have a deep notch between them. Most largemouth bass do not have a tooth patch. Largemouth bass also typically have 59 to 67 lateral line scales, while Florida bass typically have 69 to 73 lateral line scales. The largemouth bass has a broad native range as you can see and has been widely introduced around the world due to its popularity as a sport fish. There is a natural zone of introgression with the Florida bass that extends roughly from the Choctahatchee River drainage east to the Savannah River drainage. Within this zone, shown in red, you find mostly largemouth Florida bass hybrids, but you also have largemouth bass and Florida bass, so it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to identify fish without genetics if you happen to be fishing inside this area. Largemouth bass are considered habitat generalists and can be found in lakes and streams throughout their native range. Diet has been known to include other fish, insects, crustaceans, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and even small mammals. Largemouth bass max out around 27 inches. The IGFA All Tackle World Record weighed 22 pounds, 4 ounces, and there's actually a tie for the record. One came from Montgomery Lake in Georgia, which is actually a slough off the Elkmulgee River, and the other one came from Lake Biwa in Japan. Most experts believe the Montgomery Lake fish was most likely a Florida bass or a largemouth Florida hybrid. The fish from Lake Biwa was identified as a Florida bass, but the IGFA does not have separate record categories for largemouth bass and Florida bass. Okay, next is the Florida bass. The Florida bass was first identified by science in 1822. It was later described as a subspecies of the largemouth bass in 1949, but additional research has shown it should be elevated to a distinct species. Today, many experts recognize the Florida bass as a separate species, but it's still technically considered a subspecies of the largemouth bass by the American Fisheries Society. The Florida bass is the largest species in the Micropterus genus and the largest member of the sunfish family. Florida bass and largemouth bass have the largest mouths of all the black basses. On most Florida bass and largemouth bass, the upper jaw, or maxilla, extends beyond the back of the eye when the mouth is closed. Body coloration can vary, again, based on several factors. Florida bass, like the largemouth bass, have a midlateral stripe that's often broken into a series of blotches, forming a jagged horizontal stripe that runs from the snout to the caudal fin. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected, but have a deep notch between them. Most Florida bass do not have a tooth patch on the tongue. Florida bass also typically have 69 to 73 lateral line scales, while largemouth bass typically have 59 to 67 lateral line scales. Florida bass are native to the Florida Peninsula. The northern extent of its native range reaches to the mouth of the St. Johns River and west to the Suwannee River drainage. North of this area is a zone of introgression that contains mostly hybrids with intermediate characteristics of Florida bass and largemouth bass. Largemouth bass and Florida bass are also found in this natural zone of introgression, so it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to identify fish without genetics if you happen to be fishing inside this area. The zone of introgression extends roughly from the Choctaw Hetchy River and the Florida Panhandle east to the Savannah River drainage in Georgia. And just to be clear, the St. Johns River and the Oklawaha River are now considered intergrade systems and have been since a 2010 study found largemouth bass alleles in 12 different populations. Florida bass are considered habitat generalists and can be found in lakes and streams throughout their native range. Diet has been known to include other fish, insects, crustaceans, amphibians, reptiles, birds, 
and even small mammals. Florida bass max out around 30 inches. The IGFA All Tackle World Record weighed 22 pounds, 4 ounces, and there's actually a tie for the record. One came from Montgomery Lake in Georgia, which is actually a slough off the Okmulgee River, and the other came from Lake Biwa in Japan. Most experts believe the Montgomery Lake fish was most likely a Florida bass or a largemouth Florida hybrid. The fish from Lake Biwa was identified as a Florida bass, but the IGFA does not have separate record categories for largemouth bass and Florida bass. Next is a fish most anglers have probably never heard of, the Quattro Cienegas bass. As you might have guessed, Quattro Cienegas is Spanish and it means four marshes. The Quattro Cienegas bass is a distinct form of largemouth bass that's endemic to northern Mexico. It hasn't been described by science, so the Quattro Cienegas bass is considered a provisional species. There isn't a lot of info about this fish on the internet, but it's only found in the Quattro Cienegas Basin in Coahuila, Mexico. The Quattro Cienegas Basin is an official nature reserve, so I wouldn't plan a fishing trip there. It's a protected area. The Quattro Cienegas Basin is a closed basin, which means no water flows out of the basin. It's basically a series of isolated wetlands, pools, and streams surrounded by mountains in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert. The mountains around the basin capture and channel rainwater downhill through limestone rock back into the basin. The wetlands, pools, and streams are sustained by over 200 springs that originate near the surrounding mountains. It's really a unique ecosystem with lots of endemic species found nowhere else in the world. The Quattro Cienegas bass is a distinct form of largemouth bass endemic to the Quattro Cienegas ecosystem in Coahuila, Mexico. Quattro Cienegas bass most likely have a similar diet to the largemouth bass and Florida bass. The Quattro Cienegas bass is a distinct form of largemouth bass endemic to the Quattro Cienegas ecosystem in Coahuila, Mexico. There isn't a lot of info about this fish online, and you can't legally fish there, so this is a total guess based on my limited knowledge of that ecosystem. But Quattro Cienegas bass probably max out around 20 or 22 inches and they may not get that big. They've been able to persist in these desert wetlands for a long time, where growing to a large size would be a disadvantage during droughts and other low water periods. So you'd expect them to be a lot smaller than the native largemouth bass in Texas. Okay, next is the Swanee Bass. The Swanee Bass was first described by science in 1949. Body coloration can vary based on several factors, but is generally dark fading gradually to a gray belly. Swanee bass have 12 to 16 dark, vertical diamond-shaped blotches along both sides of the fish. These blotches become shorter and often fuse together near the tail to form a lateral band. The most distinguishing characteristic of the Swanee bass is the turquoise blue coloration on the head, cheek, gill cover, and sometimes ventral parts of mature fish around the spawn. Swanee bass have relatively large mouths. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye but not past it when the mouth is closed. Most Swanee bass have a circular tooth patch on the tongue. The Swanee bass is native to the Swanee and Oklahoma river drainages in Georgia and Florida. And it has been introduced to the St. Marks, Wasissa, and Oscilla river systems in the Florida Panhandle. Swanee bass are kind of unique because they're one of the few stream specialists in the Micropterus genus that's found exclusively below the fall line. As a stream specialist, Swanee bass are often more abundant in stream sections with higher channel gradients, especially during the summer. Water flows downhill so you're going to have more current in sections where the channel gradient is steeper. And this is true with all stream specialists. If you're not catching them or you're only catching largemouth, you need to find a section with more current. Swanee bass are also more commonly found in areas that have rock or coarse sand substrate with some kind of wood cover. Swanee bass feed heavily on crayfishes, but they're also known to eat other crustaceans, fish, aquatic insects, and blue crabs in lower estuarine river sections. Average size for the Swanee bass is around 10 inches and they max out around 17 inches. 
The IGFA all-tackle world record weighed 3 pounds 14 ounces and was caught from the Suwannee River in Florida. Okay, next is the spotted bass. The spotted bass was first described from the Ohio River in 1819. It was later split into two subspecies in 1940. The northern spotted bass, native to the Mississippi River Basin, and the Alabama spotted bass, native to the Mobile River Basin. In 2008, the Alabama spotted bass was split from the spotted bass and elevated to a full species as the Alabama bass after extensive genetic analysis and other research revealed it was not a spotted bass. The northern spotted bass retains the name spotted bass because it was described first in 1819. By the way, I'm not a fan of nicknames because they just confuse people. That's one of the reasons I made this video. Spotted bass have several nicknames including northern spotted bass and Kentucky spotted bass but there's only one true spotted bass. Adding to the confusion is the fact that most anglers still call the Alabama bass a spotted bass or Coosa spotted bass 13 years after it was described as a separate species. And we're going to talk about why this needs to change in another video, but I'll go ahead and tell you right now, if you have a smallmouth fishery and the Alabama bass gets in your lake or river system, you're not going to have a smallmouth fishery it's going to disappear forever. And there's still a lot of speculation about why this happens, but what we do know is that native species typically diverge from other species as they adapt to conditions unique to the environment where they live. This process promotes reproductive isolation among native species as they develop increasingly different life histories, traits, and behaviors over long periods of time. But when humans start moving fish around, these natural barriers to reproduction no longer exist, resulting in widespread hybridization between species. And that's what's happening with the Alabama bass. Smallmouth bass, spotted bass, and largemouth bass are all native to the Mississippi River Basin, so they're able to coexist within the same water body just fine. But Alabama bass are not spotted bass, so when humans introduce them, you're always going to have widespread hybridization with the smallmouth bass. And the Alabama bass will eventually eliminate smallmouth bass from not only that water body, but all of the streams flowing into and out of that water body. This has already happened to several streams and man-made impoundments in Georgia, North Carolina, and now Tennessee and Virginia. Non-native Alabama bass will also negatively impact the trophy size potential and overall number of largemouth bass in your lake or river system. We're going to talk about all this in another video, so for now, let's get back to the real spotted bass, which is native to the Mississippi River Basin from southern Ohio and West Virginia south to Louisiana. The native range of the spotted bass currently includes several Gulf Slope drainages from Mississippi to Texas, but additional research could change this. In 2015, the Choctaw bass was split from the spotted bass. Choctaw bass are native to the eastern Gulf Coastal Rivers in southeast Alabama and the western Florida Panhandle. But anglers unaware of this still call them spotted bass. Body coloration of the spotted bass can vary based on several factors, but is generally green to olive above the mid-lateral stripe and mostly white below. The species name Punculatus is Latin and means dotted. This name refers to the dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows below the midlateral stripe. Spotted bass also have 7 to 10 blotches on the back called dorsal blotches. Some of these dorsal blotches will touch the base of the spiny dorsal fin. The midlateral stripe typically has around 12 dark diamond shaped blotches along the midline of the body. These blotches become shorter and often coalesce into a solid stripe near the tail. On most spotted bass, the upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye but not past it when the mouth is closed. Spotted bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Spotted bass also typically have 55 to 71 lateral line scales, while Alabama bass typically have 68 to 84 lateral line scales. Spotted bass are habitat generalists and can be found in man-made lakes and streams throughout their native range. Spotted bass, smallmouth bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Mississippi River Basin. The spotted bass is kind of an intermediate species. 
so they're often found in areas that have less cover and more current than largemouth bass prefer. They're also more commonly found in areas with a sand or silt substrate and less current than smallmouth bass generally prefer. In creeks and rivers, spotted bass primarily feed on crayfish, insects, and other small fish. In man-made impoundments, spotted bass feed primarily on shad and other fish in open water. Spotted bass rarely exceed 18 inches or 3 pounds, and they max out around 5 pounds. Tennessee and Texas, I believe, are the only states that currently have separate records for spotted bass and Alabama bass. The Tennessee state record spotted bass weighed 6 pounds 1 ounce and was caught from Lake Chickamauga. Georgia and Alabama do not have separate record categories for spotted bass and Alabama bass, so the spotted bass records in those states are held by Alabama bass. The IGFA recently created separate record categories for spotted bass and Alabama bass after it was discovered that all of the world record spotted bass from California were actually Alabama bass. We just talked about how the Alabama bass was described as a subspecies in 1940, the Alabama spotted bass. It was elevated to a full species in 2008 as the Alabama bass after extensive genetic analysis and other research revealed it was not a spotted bass. Most anglers still call the Alabama bass a spotted bass or Coosa spotted bass 13 years after it was recognized as a separate species. Even though their native ranges do not overlap, Alabama bass have physical traits that are very similar to spotted bass. Body coloration is similar above and below the midline. Alabama bass also have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows below the midlateral stripe. Alabama bass usually have 10 to 12 dorsal blotches that do not touch the base of the spiny dorsal fin. The midlateral stripe typically has around 15 or more dark, diamond-shaped blotches along the midline of the body. The blotches not only get smaller near the tail, but the midlateral stripe also ends in a series of blotches near the base of the caudal fin. On spotted bass, the midlateral stripe typically ends in a solid stripe. Also worth noting, Alabama bass have smaller midlateral blotches most of the time because they have more of them. On spotted bass, the midlateral blotches are larger because they do not have as many. On most Alabama bass, the upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye but not past it when the mouth is closed. Alabama bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Alabama bass also typically have 68 to 84 lateral line scales, while spotted bass typically have 55 to 71 lateral line scales. Alabama bass also generally have a more streamlined and elongated body shape, while spotted bass usually are more football shaped. Again, the native ranges of these two fish do not overlap naturally, so identification should be pretty straightforward, unless you happen to be fishing a drainage where one or both species have been illegally introduced. The Middle Chattahoochee, Hiawassee, and Little Tennessee River drainages are a perfect example of this. Hybridization between spotted bass, Alabama bass, and other native species has been extensive and ongoing for over 30 years in some areas. When hybrid black bass start back crossing, the offspring can resemble parent species and possess many of the same physical traits, so you can't reliably identify fish in these areas without genetic analysis. Alabama bass are only native to the Mobile River Basin, but have been widely introduced illegally. The illegal introduction and spread of non-native Alabama bass has not only ruined countless fisheries, they have caused the local extinction of several native species of black bass. Alabama bass readily hybridize with other species of black bass outside their native range, so anglers should never move them. We're actually going to talk more about this and why you should never move fish around in another video. This one was just way too long. Alabama bass are habitat generalists and can be found in man-made lakes and streams throughout their native range. In creeks and rivers, Alabama bass primarily feed on crayfish and other fish. In man-made impoundments, Alabama bass feed primarily on shad, herring, and other fish in open water. 
In the Mobile River Basin, where Alabama bass are native, they often grow faster and much larger than spotted bass. However, that's not always the case where Alabama bass have been illegally introduced. Once native species decline or have been eliminated and Alabama bass take over a water body, these non-native populations often become stunted. Average size for the Alabama bass is around 14 inches, but they can max out around 23 inches or 8 pounds in some man-made impoundments. The IGFA all-tackle world record weighed 11 pounds 4 ounces and was caught from Bullard's Bar Reservoir in California. Bullard's Bar Reservoir, by the way, has kokanee salmon and trout, so that's a big reason why they grow so much larger out there. Okay, next is the Choctaw bass. The name Choctaw comes from the Native American tribe that used to live in the area where the Choctaw bass was found. In 2015, the Choctaw bass was split from the spotted bass. Choctaw bass were formally described, but the description has not yet been published. For now, Choctaw bass are informally recognized as a separate provisional species, but most anglers still call them spotted bass. Choctaw bass are native to the eastern Gulf Coast rivers in southeast Alabama and the western Florida panhandle. Even though their native ranges do not overlap, Choctaw bass have physical traits that are very similar to spotted bass. That's actually why the Choctaw bass wasn't discovered until 2007. Choctaw bass can usually be distinguished from other species by counting scales, fin rays, and gill rakers. For most anglers, however, this really isn't necessary because the native range of the Choctaw bass does not overlap with the native range of the spotted bass or the Alabama bass. That's another reason why it's important not to move fish around. Choctaw bass have relatively large mouths. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye, but not past it, when the mouth is closed. Choctaw bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Choctaw bass are native to the eastern Gulf Coast rivers in southeast Alabama and the western Florida panhandle. This area includes the Perdido, Escambia, Blackwater Yellow, and Choctaw Hatchie River drainages. Choctaw bass are another one of the few stream specialists in the Micropterus genus that's found exclusively below the fall line. As a stream specialist, Choctaw bass are more abundant in creeks and small to medium rivers with higher average channel gradients. Choctaw bass are also more commonly found in areas that have rock, gravel, or coarse sand substrate with some kind of wood cover. Choctaw bass feed heavily on crayfishes, but they also eat other crustaceans, insects, and fish. Average size for the Choctaw bass is around 10 inches, and they max out around 18 inches. Okay, next is the Guadalupe bass. The Guadalupe bass was first described by science in 1874. It's also the only black bass endemic to the state of Texas, where it's also the official state fish. Body coloration can vary based on several factors, but is generally an olive green color that extends much lower on the body past the midline. The ventral region, or belly, is typically white. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct, horizontal rows below the midlateral stripe. Guadalupe bass usually have 10 to 12 dark, diamond-shaped vertical bars along the midline of the body. These vertical bars often turn into a series of shorter blotches near the tail. The upper jaw, or maxilla, can extend to the back of the eye, but not past it when the mouth is closed. Guadalupe bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. The Guadalupe bass is endemic to the Edwards Plateau region. This part of central Texas is commonly known as the Texas Hill Country. The Guadalupe bass is native to the San Antonio, Guadalupe, Colorado, and Brazos river drainages. The natural range of the Guadalupe bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments and the introduction and spread of non-native smallmouth bass. Guadalupe bass are stream specialists, so they are not typically found in man-made impoundments. Streams that retain free-flowing characteristics usually have the best populations. 
Guadalupe bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Guadalupe bass is around 10 inches and they max out around 18 inches. The Texas state record weighed 3 pounds 11 ounces and was caught from the Colorado River near Austin, Texas. Okay, next is the shoal bass. The shoal bass was formerly described by science as a new species in 1999. Prior to this, it was considered to be a red-eye bass or subspecies of red-eye bass based on the original 1940 description of that species. The common name shoal bass was chosen because this fish inhabits high gradient rivers and large creeks with shoals. The fish had also been known as the shoal bass by anglers since the early 1970s. That was kind of a local or regional name. It was also sometimes called the Flint River smallmouth. The specific name cataractae is from the Latin cataracta, which means waterfall. That's a reference to the waterfall or shoal habitat where the shoal bass is often found. Body coloration can vary based on several factors, but generally ranges from olive green to dark olive and extends lower on the body past the midlateral stripe. The ventral region or belly is typically white to cream colored. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form irregular horizontal rows. Shoal bass usually have 10 to 15 dark vertically elongated midlateral blotches or bars. The blotches usually become wider and more square shaped near the tail. Most shoal bass also have a large square blotch at the base of the caudal fin called a basicaudal spot or blotch. The pelvic fins also typically have a white translucent appearance. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye but not past it when the mouth is closed. Most shoal bass do not have a tooth patch on the tongue. Shoal bass are native to the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, and Flint River drainages. The natural range of the shoal bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments and the introduction and spread of non-native spotted bass, Alabama bass, and smallmouth bass. In the mid-1970s, the Georgia Department of Game and Fish stocked shoal bass in the Okmulgee River. Shoal bass can hybridize with other species of black bass when humans move them outside their native range, so anglers should never move them. Of course, the Georgia Department of Game and Fish didn't know this in the mid-1970s. They thought putting shoal bass in the Okmulgee River was a good idea, but it led to the local extinction of the native Altamaha bass in that part of the river system. Today, the Okmulgee River shoal bass population is threatened by competition and hybridization from the illegally introduced Alabama bass. Shoal bass are stream specialists, so creeks and rivers that retain free-flowing characteristics often have the best populations. The Flint River is probably the best example of that in the state of Georgia. Bedrock outcrops and boulders are more commonly used by shoal bass because rock is more effective at blocking the current compared to most types of wood cover. Diet of the shoal bass includes mostly crayfish, insects, and other fish. Shoal bass, again, are stream specialists, so they are not found in man-made impoundments. They're also one of the oldest extant or living species in the Micropterus genus and have been around for almost 8 million years. Shoal bass max out around 9 pounds, so they're the largest stream specialist in the Micropterus genus by a lot. While you'll probably never see one that size, anglers do catch six to seven pound shoal bass every year. The Georgia state record shoal bass weighed eight pounds, three ounces, and was caught from the Flint River. Smallmouth bass and other illegally introduced non-native species struggle to reach weights half that size in the same drainage. Okay, let's talk about the red-eye bass. If you've watched all of these videos, you already know a rock bass is not a red-eye bass. We're talking about the real red-eye bass. The red-eye bass was first described by science in 1940 from the Coosa River drainage of the Mobile River Basin. The common name red-eye bass was chosen because it was the local or regional name for the fish in Alabama. While red-eye bass do sometimes have red eyes, the name is kind of misleading because the eyes are not red all the time. 
Eye color is variable, so they can be red, brown, or yellow. By the way, different species in the sunfish family can have red eyes, so it's not a reliable way to identify fish. Lots of males, for example, will have red eyes around the spawn. Eye color can also change due to stress and other factors. The specific name, Kuse, means of the Kusa River. That's where the original specimen used to describe the red eye bass was found. Collections made from other drainages were also used to define the range of the species. Based on the original 1940 description, the native range of the red eye bass looked like this for over 40 years. And again, that's because the shoal bass was considered to be a red eye bass or a subspecies of red eye bass until it was formally described as a separate species in 1999. After the shoal bass split in 1999, the native range of the red eye bass included five different Gulf Slope drainages and two Atlantic Slope drainages. In 2013, all five Gulf Slope populations were split into five separate species. After extensive research revealed populations from the Black Warrior, Cahaba, Tallapoosa, and Chattahoochee rivers were morphologically and genetically distinct from red eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. In the Mobile River Basin, we now have the Warrior Bass, endemic to the Black Warrior River System, the Cahaba Bass, endemic to the Cahaba River System, the Tallapoosa Bass, endemic to the Tallapoosa River System, and the Red Eye Bass, restricted to the Coosa River System. And in the Chattahoochee River drainage, we have the Chattahoochee Bass, native to the Chattahoochee River System. Additional research has shown Atlantic slope populations are also distinct from red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. Populations in the Altamaha and Savannah River drainages have not been described by science, but are informally recognized as provisional species. In the Altamaha River drainage, we have the Altamaha bass endemic to the Altamaha River system. And in the Savannah River drainage, we have the Bartram's bass native to the Savannah River system. All seven species are upland stream specialists with similar habitat and life history requirements, but populations in the Mobile Basin share a common ancestor with Alabama bass, which are also native to the Mobile Basin, while eastern populations are more closely related to shoal bass. By the way, upland stream specialists are even more specialized stream specialists. Upland stream specialists are only found above the fall line, they're not only the smallest members of the Micropterus genus, they're also the slowest growing and may take up to four years to reach maturity. All seven upland species of black bass are sometimes collectively known as red-eye bass, mainly because they were classified as red-eye bass for over 70 years. It's also a lot easier to say red-eye bass, but I still prefer upland species of black bass because I don't want to confuse people. When I talk about red-eye bass in these videos, I want people to know I'm talking about the real red-eye bass that's only native to the Coosa River system. And I've said this before, but taxonomy is like Highlander. There can be only one, and there really is only one red-eye bass. So let's talk about the real red-eye bass, which does have a nickname, and I'm not a fan of nicknames because they confuse people, but some anglers call red-eye bass Coosa red-eye bass or just Coosa bass. And that's because red-eye bass are native only to the Coosa River drainage in Alabama, Georgia, and a small part of Tennessee. The native range of the red-eye bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Red-eye bass, Alabama bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Coosa River system. Red-eye bass have been introduced to several states including Tennessee, Kentucky, Arizona, and California. Red-eye bass can and do hybridize with other species of black bass when humans move them outside their native range, so anglers should never move them. The Tennessee Game and Fish Commission stocked non-native red-eye bass during the 1950s in the Tennessee and Cumberland River drainages, resulting in widespread hybridization between red-eye bass and the native smallmouth bass. Today, you have very few smallmouth bass in those streams, and you also find very few red-eye bass. Most of the fish they collect and genotype turn out to be some kind of smallmouth red-eye hybrid. So again, please do not move black bass around or stock them outside their native range. It never works, you just end up with a bunch of hybrids, and here's another example of that. 
Body coloration of the red-eye bass can vary, but the back and sides are generally olive green to brown with a bronze shimmer. This coloration often extends below the midline, fading to a white ventral region or belly. Dark olive mottling is often present on the lower sides and ventral region. Red-eye bass typically have 10 to 13 blotches in a row along the midline of the body. Red-eye bass have six or fewer vertical blotches and the rest are usually too diffuse to recognize as blotches, especially with some of the larger adults. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins are typically a brick red or tea color. On red-eye bass, the outer margin of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have a pronounced white edge. The pelvic fins typically have a white translucent appearance. Spawning male red-eye bass often have a bluish green color on the lower head and throat. The red-eye bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye, but not past it when the mouth is closed. Red-eye bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Red-eye bass are upland stream specialists. Upland stream specialists are only found above the fall line because that's where you find upland streams and upland stream conditions. Upland streams drain upland or mountain landscapes that are more common near the headwaters of most drainage systems. When you have steeper slopes and higher channel gradients, Water not only flows downstream faster, it has greater stream power to move and transport sediment. This produces the other characteristics of an upland stream. A stream bed dominated by bedrock and coarse sediments, a riffle and pool structure, and cooler water temperatures. Upland streams are fed primarily by groundwater, so the water is generally clear, cool, and low in nutrients. It's also well aerated by riffle and shoal areas, and because the water is cool, upland streams typically have high levels of dissolved oxygen. These are ideal habitat conditions for macroinvertebrates with high oxygen needs. Macroinvertebrates are small aquatic animals like insects in their larval or nymph form, crayfish, snails, and worms. Most aquatic insects and aquatic insect larvae have primitive gill structures where they absorb oxygen directly from the surrounding water through their skin. That's why upland streams typically have an invertebrate forage base. If you know anything about growing trophy bass, you know you need a quality forage base. Most ponds, for example, will have a bluegill forage base. In a man-made impoundment, you might have a shad or herring forage base. Out in California, where they grow most of the records these days, you often have a trout or kokanee salmon forage base. And in Texas, where they grow a lot of fish in the teens, a lot of those lakes will have tilapia. Upland streams, on the other hand, have all this fast-moving, cool groundwater that's low in nutrients and a mostly insect forage base, so you're just not going to grow big bass under those conditions. Red-eye bass and other upland species of black bass typically max out around 14 inches for this reason. Anything larger than that is most likely going to be some kind of hybrid. The small size and slow growth rate are an adaptation or specialization to the upland stream environment and that's what really allows these fish to persist in areas larger fish can't. It's also what ultimately limits or restricts their distribution to creeks and rivers above the fall line. Many invertebrate species depend on the spaces between rocks to shelter them from high water velocities. These are called interstitial spaces, and they not only provide a refuge from the current and predators like fish, they also collect organic material that different macroinvertebrates feed on. If you watch any of the videos where I target upland species of black bass, you're going to see a lot of clean, coarse gravel and rock on the bottom of the stream. You can certainly catch red-eyed bass and other upland species of black bass over a sand bottom, but they're typically going to be more abundant in streams where you have a clean, coarse substrate on the bottom. And that's because these areas usually have more macroinvertebrates. During the late spring and summer months, red-eye bass feed heavily on terrestrial insects that fall into the water, so they often hold directly under or just downstream from trees, bushes, and other plants that hang over the water. This is when you might actually find these fish over a sand bottom, 
but there usually needs to be some kind of rock or wood cover present to act as a current break. In the fall and winter, red-eye bass move back to areas that are mostly rock or bedrock because it's better at blocking the current compared to most types of wood cover. Average size for the red-eye bass is around 8 inches and they max out around 14 inches. Most records for red-eye bass are actually hybrids caught before genetic analysis was used to confirm species ID. Okay, next is the warrior bass. The warrior bass is endemic to the Black Warrior River drainage in Alabama and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. In 2013, the warrior bass was described as a separate species after extensive research revealed populations from the Black Warrior, Cahaba, Tallapoosa, and Chattahoochee rivers were morphologically and genetically distinct from red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. The native range of the warrior bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Warrior bass, Alabama bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Black Warrior River system. So identification is pretty straightforward if you know what drainage you're fishing. And if you don't know what drainage you're fishing, you can always just look at Google Maps and follow the creek or river you're fishing downstream. Warrior bass can hybridize with Alabama bass. This seems to be more common in areas where man-made impoundments have been built. Man-made impoundments not only destroy warrior bass habitat, they drown natural barriers like waterfalls and big drops that prevent or limit the upstream dispersal of Alabama bass. While it's true you can't always identify hybrid black bass in the field, some are obviously hybrids because they possess physical traits that are unique to multiple species. I caught a few Alabama warrior bass hybrids in the warrior bass videos, so check those out if you want to see what some of the hybrids can look like. Body coloration of the warrior bass can vary, but the back and sides above the midline are generally golden brown to light green or olive. Below the midline, the sides and ventral region or belly are white. Warrior bass typically have 7 to 13 pronounced black blotches in a row along the midline of the body. The first four to six blotches are usually vertical bars that are followed by shorter, more rounded blotches. Warrior bass also have eight to 12 irregular dark blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The leading edge of the soft dorsal fin has some orange coloration. The anal fin also has a faint orange tint and the outer margin is white. The upper and lower margins of the caudal fin have a broad white border with an orange tint. The base of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have dark spots or dots. The pelvic fins typically have a white translucent appearance. Spawning males often have a bluish green color on the lower head and throat. The warrior bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye, but not past it when the mouth is closed. Most warrior bass do not have a tooth patch on the tongue. And that's really interesting because the warrior bass is the only upland species of black bass that does not have a tooth patch on the tongue. And according to the biologists, about 80% of the warrior bass they collect do not have a tooth patch on the tongue. So a few will have it, but for the most part, uh, they do not. 80%, that's a pretty high number. Warrior bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Black Warrior River drainage above the fall line. Creeks and rivers that have not been impacted by land use changes with free flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients typically have the best populations. Land use changes are any kind of human activity that might cause erosion or excess sediment to enter a stream. Land development and clearing from construction, mining, farming, and logging are some of the more common land use changes that cause erosion. When gravel and rock substrate is covered by fine sediment, it can reduce or eliminate the quality and quantity of interstitial habitat for fish and macroinvertebrates. The warrior bass is one of four upland species of black bass native to the Mobile River Basin. 
warrior bass, Cahaba bass, red-eye bass, and Tallapoosa bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin. The warrior bass and the Cahaba bass are the only black bass endemic to the state of Alabama. Endemic means they're found there and nowhere else in the world. The warrior bass and the Cahaba bass are also the only members of the sunfish family endemic to the state of Alabama. The natural range of the warrior bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments and land use changes in the greater Birmingham area. Warrior bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the warrior bass is around 8 inches and they max out around 14 inches. Okay, next is the Cahaba bass. The Cahaba bass is endemic to the Cahaba River drainage in Alabama and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. In 2013, the Cahaba bass was described as a separate species after extensive research revealed populations from the Black Warrior, Cahaba, Tallapoosa, and Chattahoochee rivers were morphologically and genetically distinct from red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. The native range of the Cahaba bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Cahaba bass, Alabama bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Cahaba River system. Cahaba bass can hybridize with Alabama bass. This seems to be more common in parts of the drainage that have been heavily impacted by land use changes. Non-native smallmouth bass were recently found in the Cahaba River near Birmingham, so the Cahaba bass, which is only found in the Cahaba River drainage, is also threatened by hybridization from the illegally introduced smallmouth bass. And if you know what happened at Lake Chattoog or Blue Ridge Lake in Georgia, you'd know you're never going to have a catchable population of smallmouth bass in the Mobile Basin, where Alabama bass are native. You're just going to end up with a bunch of hybrid black bass in the Cahaba River system. Smallmouth bass are native to the Tennessee River drainage, which is only one hour north of Birmingham, and a few creeks are actually closer than that. Body coloration of the Cahaba bass can vary, but the back and sides above the midline are usually olive green to bronze. Below the midline, the sides and ventral region, or belly, are white. Cahaba bass typically have 7 to 12 blotches in a row along the midline of the body. The first 6 to 9 blotches are usually wide vertical bars that are followed by shorter, more rounded blotches. Cahaba bass also have 8 to 12 irregular dark blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct, horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. Irregular dark shaded areas are often present on the lower sides and ventral region of large adults. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The outer margin of the soft dorsal caudal and anal fins have a white edge. The base of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have dark spots or dots. The pelvic fin color can vary but often has a white translucent appearance. Cahaba bass and Tallapoosa bass are the only upland species of black bass that do not have orange or red pigment on any portion of the fins. Spawning males often have a bluish green color on the lower head and throat. The Cahaba bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver-white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, extends to the back of the eye, but not past it, when the mouth is closed. Cahaba bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Cahaba bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Cahaba River drainage above the fall line. Creeks and rivers that have not been heavily impacted by land use changes with free-flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients, typically have the best populations. The Cahaba bass is one of four upland species of black bass native to the Mobile River Basin. Cahaba bass, warrior bass, red-eye bass, and Tallapoosa bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin. The Cahaba bass and the warrior bass are the only black bass endemic to the state of Alabama. Endemic means they're found there and nowhere else in the world. 
Cahaba bass and warrior bass are also the only members of the sunfish family endemic to the state of Alabama. The natural range of the Cahaba bass has been heavily impacted by land use changes in the greater Birmingham area. Cahaba bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Cahaba bass is around 8 inches and they max out around 14 inches. Okay, next is the Tallapoosa bass. The Tallapoosa bass is endemic to the Tallapoosa River drainage and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. In 2013, the Tallapoosa bass was described as a separate species after extensive research revealed populations from the Black Warrior, Cahaba, Tallapoosa, and Chattahoochee rivers were morphologically and genetically distinct from red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. The native range of the Tallapoosa bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Tallapoosa bass, Alabama bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Tallapoosa River system. Tallapoosa bass can hybridize with Alabama bass. This seems to be more common in parts of the drainage that have been heavily impacted by land use changes. I caught a few Alabama Tallapoosa bass hybrids in the Tallapoosa bass videos, so check those out if you want to see what some of the hybrids can look like. Body coloration of the Tallapoosa bass can vary, but the back and sides above the midline are usually olive green to bronze. Below the midline, the sides and ventral region or belly are white. Tallapoosa bass typically have 10 to 13 vertical bars in a row along the midline of the body. The first 6 to 12 blotches are long vertical bars that are followed by vertically elongated blotches. Tallapoosa bass also have 9 to 11 irregular blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. Irregular dark shaded areas are often present on the lower sides and ventral region of large adults. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The outer margin of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have a white edge. The base of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have dark spots or dots. The pelvic fin color can vary, but often has a white translucent appearance. Tallapoosa bass and Cahaba bass are the only upland species of black bass that do not have orange or red pigment on any portion of the fins. Spawning males often have a bluish green color on the lower head and throat. The Tallapoosa bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw or maxilla extends to the back of the eye but not past it when the mouth is closed. Tallapoosa bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Tallapoosa bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Tallapoosa River drainage above the fall line. Creeks and rivers that have not been impacted by land use changes with free flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients typically have the best populations. The Tallapoosa bass is one of four upland species of black bass native to the Mobile River Basin. Tallapoosa bass, Cahaba bass, warrior bass, and red-eye bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin. The natural range of the Tallapoosa bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments. Tallapoosa bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Tallapoosa bass is around 8 inches, and they max out around 14 inches. Okay, next is the Chattahoochee bass. The Chattahoochee bass is endemic to the Chattahoochee River drainage and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. In 2013, the Chattahoochee bass was described as a separate species after extensive research revealed populations from the Black Warrior, Cahaba, Tallapoosa, and Chattahoochee rivers were morphologically and genetically distinct from red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. 
warrior bass, Cahaba bass, red-eye bass, and Tallapoosa bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin. Chattahoochee bass, Altamaha bass, and Bartram's bass, on the other hand, are more closely related to shoal bass. The native range of the Chattahoochee bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Body coloration of the Chattahoochee bass can vary, but the back and sides above the midline are usually olive green to bronze. Below the midline, the sides and ventral region, or belly, are white. Chattahoochee bass typically have 9 to 11 blotches in a row along the midline of the body. The first four to seven blotches are vertically elongated, followed by shorter, more diamond-shaped blotches. Chattahoochee bass also have nine to 13 irregular blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. Irregular dark shaded areas are often present below the midline on the lower sides and ventral region. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have bright orange pigment with white margins. The base of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have dark spots or dots. The pelvic fin color can vary but often has a white translucent appearance. Spawning males often have a bluish green color on the lower head and throat. The Chattahoochee bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver-white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, extends to the back of the eye, but not past it, when the mouth is closed. Chattahoochee bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Chattahoochee bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Chattahoochee River drainage above the fall line. Chattahoochee bass, shoal bass, and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Chattahoochee River system. The natural range of the Chattahoochee bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments, land use changes, and the illegal introduction and spread of non-native Alabama bass. Creeks and rivers that have not been heavily impacted by land use changes with natural or man-made barriers that prevent or limit the spread of illegally introduced Alabama bass have the best populations. Chattahoochee bass prefer sections with free-flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients. Chattahoochee bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Chattahoochee bass is around 8 inches and they max out around 14 inches. Okay, next is the Altamaha bass. The Altamaha bass is endemic to the Altamaha River drainage and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. The Altamaha bass has not been described by science, but is informally recognized as a provisional species. Several studies have shown populations in the Altamaha, Chattahoochee, and Savannah River drainages are morphologically and genetically distinct from each other and red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. Warrior bass, Cahaba bass, red-eye bass, and Tallapoosa bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin, while Altamaha bass, Chattahoochee bass, and Bartram's bass are more closely related to shoal bass. The native range of the Altamaha bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Body coloration of the Altamaha bass can vary, but the back and sides above the midline are usually olive green to bronze. Below the midline, the sides and ventral region or belly are white. Altamaha bass typically have 8 to 11 blotches in a row along the midline of the body. The first four to seven blotches are vertically elongated, followed by shorter, more diamond-shaped blotches. Altamaha bass have nine to 13 irregular dark blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. 
The leading edge of the soft dorsal and anal fins are usually orange, and the upper and lower margins of the caudal fin also have a narrow orange margin. The base of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins have dark spots or dots. The pelvic fin color can vary, but often has a white translucent appearance. Spawning males often have a bluish-green color on the lower head and throat. The Altamaha bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver-white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, extends to the back of the eye, but not past it, when the mouth is closed. Altamaha bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Altamaha bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Altamaha River drainage above the fall line. The Altamaha bass is also the only black bass endemic to the state of Georgia. Endemic means it's found here and nowhere else in the world. The Altamaha bass is also the only member of the sunfish family endemic to the state of Georgia. Altamaha bass, largemouth bass, and Florida bass are the only black bass native to the Altamaha River system. The natural range of the Altamaha bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments, land use changes, and the illegal introduction and spread of non-native Alabama bass. Creeks and rivers that have not been heavily impacted by land use changes with natural or man-made barriers that prevent or limit the spread of illegally introduced Alabama bass have the best populations. Altamaha bass prefer sections with free-flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients. Altamaha bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Altamaha bass is around 8 inches, and they max out around 14 inches. Okay, next is the Bartram's bass. The Bartram's bass is endemic to the Savannah River drainage and is one of seven upland species of black bass previously recognized as red-eye bass. The Bartram's bass is named after American naturalist William Bartram who explored the region in the 18th century. The Bartram's bass has not been described by science, but is informally recognized as a provisional species. Several studies have shown populations in the Savannah, Altamaha, and Chattahoochee River drainages are morphologically and genetically distinct from each other and red-eye bass in the Coosa River drainage. Warrior bass, Cahaba bass, red-eye bass, and Tallapoosa bass share a common ancestor with the Alabama bass that's also native to the Mobile River Basin, while Bartram's bass, Altamaha bass, and Chattahoochee bass are more closely related to shoal bass. The native range of the Bartram's bass does not overlap with any other upland species of black bass. Body coloration of the Bartram's bass can vary, but the back and sides are usually an olive green to bronze color that often extends much lower on the body past the midline. The lower sides and ventral region or belly are white. Bartram's bass typically have 8 to 11 blotches in a row along the midline of the body. The first 4 to 7 blotches are vertically elongated, followed by shorter, more diamond-shaped blotches. Bartram's bass also have 9 to 13 irregular dark blotches on the back. The scales below the midline of the body have dark scale spots that form distinct, horizontal rows of spots on the lower sides and ventral region. Irregular dark shaded areas are often present on the lower sides and ventral region. The spiny and soft dorsal fins are connected with a very shallow notch. The outer portion of the soft dorsal, caudal, and anal fins usually have some orange to yellow coloration. The upper and lower margins of the caudal fin also have a white to cream edge. The base of the soft dorsal fin has dark spots or dots, while the caudal and anal fins do not. The pelvic fin color can vary, but often has a white translucent appearance. Spawning males often have a bluish-green color on the lower head and throat. The Bartram's bass, like all upland species of black bass, has a distinct silver-white crescent on the back of the eye. The upper jaw, or maxilla, extends to the back of the eye, but not past it when the mouth is closed. 
Bartram's bass do have a tooth patch on the tongue. Bartram's bass are upland stream specialists endemic to the Savannah River drainage above the fall line. Bartram's bass and largemouth bass are the only black bass native to the Savannah River system. The natural range of the Bartram's bass has been greatly reduced by the construction of man-made impoundments, land use changes, and the illegal introduction and spread of non-native smallmouth bass and Alabama bass. Creeks and rivers that have not been heavily impacted by land use changes with natural or man-made barriers that prevent or limit the spread of illegally introduced Alabama bass have the best populations. Bartram's bass prefer sections with free-flowing characteristics and higher average channel gradients. Bartram's bass feed mainly on crayfish, insects, other invertebrates, and fish. Average size for the Bartram's bass is around 8 inches and they max out around 14 inches.